I'm having with my with my uh, with my students. My God, yeah, I can't even talk every day. Okay, so let me know if you have any questions at the moment in time. If not, I'll keep on going. Alrighty, so. Alrighty, so um, in terms of focus, okay, so I'll keep on going because this is a this is a topic that I can talk about for like three hours straight and give a give a mini lecture kind of thing. So what is happening? Oh no, it's gonna okay. Like that. Can you see my screen? Yes, you can. Wait. Okay, cool. There you go. Okay, much better. No, that's not better. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Okay, so I can talk about this forever because um, parents always tell me that focus is an issue. So let's talk about, first of all, um, eye contact. When children look at your face or not. So how do you teach it? Um, I released a video on YouTube, I think around last week, talking about whether you should do eye contact or not, but the summary is, dude, you shouldn't do, you shouldn't teach eye contact as a as a main task, and that's because um, you're, if you if you want your child to look at you, that's something very selfish, and we don't like it when we uh, we don't like it when we're focused on what you want as a parent. We want to focus on what the child wants, right? So, what is the function of looking, at anyways? The, so, the function of um, eye contact. There's like two reasons. Number one is that we use our eyes to initiate communication, right? That's the best way to initiate communication. So uh, a reason why we do it, or like how we do it in the, in, in the real life scenario is that when we want to talk to somebody, whether it's a stranger or not, we wanna ask for the direction, our eyes will look at that person first and then, and then we will like go forward and go like, excuse me like that right so it's it's a way to initiate communication so if your child already has a way to initiate with you meaning you know they might scream shout hit you whatever to teach them the eye contact to replace that initiation behavior like like that is super super hard right it's super hard because you cannot take you cannot put your eye your, your fingers into the eyes and move them towards your face it's just impossible so that's the function number one of eye contact. If you guys think about focus as eye contact, then you know you should listen to this. Number two is that uh, we use eye we use eye contact to look at someone's face, to look at some cues from uh, like information on the face, like whether if we ask, for instance, if you ask your spouse or you ask your parents, "Hey, what do you want to eat today?" After that question, I'm going to look at their face to see to judge what they're thinking, to judge what they're thinking. So it might be like, it might be that they don't like it, right? If they don't like it, then I can actually see from their face and I will know what's, what's going to, what's happening, right? Um, so that, those are the two reasons why you want to, why you want to actually uh, have eye contact. But that's too hard of a reason for someone to understand. Okay, that's actually too hard. So if you're talking about looking at your eyes to communicate, you have to remember, is it that you're being selfish? Are you wanting your child to, to look at you because you think that's appropriate? If, you, if that's true, then you shouldn't do it. Okay, there must be a reason why. There must be a reason why, why uh, you're teaching eye contact. And if it's those two reasons, it's usually very hard to, for your child to understand at the moment, okay? They really don't understand they have to look at our facial expressions for information. And number two, use eye contact to actually um, send a signal they want to talk to you, okay? So remember that. So don't teach that. But if you really, 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 really want to, um, the only reason why I would teach it in the beginning is, as I said in the video and on YouTube, you can go check it out, is that um, they have some skill that requires them to look at your face. So for instance, if the only thing, the only thing they're working on is like speech sounds, which um, they have like real problems with pronouncing words and whatever, then I would say, and I would say, 
hey, by all means, man, go go for it. Go for it. Go teach um, eye contact first. But in a normal situation, in the language context, there's a lot more things you have to worry about before teaching eye contact. Okay, so um, let me let me give you an example of how you want your child to focus. Okay, so instead of shooting for eye contact as a way of saying, okay, this is focus. When you think about like response, responding as a way of focus. Okay, focus is just means like let me define it by my terms. I don't know the real term is. And I'm, I'm too lazy to look online. So <laughs> focus to me is like being able to sustain attention on a certain thing or person, right? But attention doesn't mean eye contact, right? I can focus on doing something without looking. I can type without looking. That when I close my eyes, I'm still typing. Doesn't mean I'm not focusing on typing. You understand what I mean? I can, uh, I can massage someone without looking. Doesn't mean that I'm not focusing when I'm looking. No. So sorry for the weird examples. But anyways, so uh, if you think about it, then the way that we, the way that we actually uh, define what is, uh, folk, is, is attention is different, right? So how do we do it is actually by teaching how to respond correctly, teaching how to respond correctly. And, and, and how do you do that? So if you are a parent right now, if you are a caregiver or someone who repeats a lot when you ask a question, when you say something that needs a, a, a response, for instance, a command or like a, a question, an instruction, and you ask, you ask it over and over and over again, then that, there's going to be a problem. Okay, there's going to be a problem. And the reason behind it is because if you say it over and over again, you're teaching your child to listen to you a few times before responding. And that's not good. And that's actually like teaching your child to ignore you. That's not good at all. So what you should do instead, which I actually just told um, my client, and she's trying to change her behavior, like good job on her, is that you have a, you might have a bad habit of repeating your questions and your commands and thinking that you can actually annoy your child into doing it. The thing you should do is actually to say it once and make it count, all right? Say it once and make it count. So if you say it once and they're not like, your child isn't responding, you have to give a certain feedback, something like, hey man, you're not listening. Hey, you didn't do it. That's not the right answer. Can you try again? Like, and then you, you have to try again and, and you need to give the same question or the same command, but, but with actually, um, with actually a, a way to help them. Okay. If, if you keep on asking and keep on giving instructions, but you're not helping the child, you're setting them up for failure. Okay. And we've talked about this in another video, but I think it's very, very important that you guys understand that attention or focus is because of how you present a question or a task. If your child isn't focusing on you, it means that they probably don't know what's happening. And what I mean by don't know what's happening is, is this, okay? They don't understand why they have to listen, why the instructions are given, why they have to do it, and what happens after they respond, okay? So if they don't understand something, the best way is to give them a reward afterwards so that the, the behavior will continue because now that there's a reason, okay? So at this moment in time, I hope everyone is on the same page. If you're watching this on YouTube, sorry. I, the, the live stream started like later because I was using a different browser that didn't work, okay? Um, sorry about that. But hey, this is the first live ever stream that uh, we're doing regularly. So if you just joined us, we're doing this every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 a.m. Jakarta time, but that's actually like 10 p.m. EST, like in the USA. So uh, I think that this time works the best for me and most of the people in this world, but we're kind of leaving the people in, the, in Europe out of this. So at any time, let me know if you need, uh, if you have any questions, all right? Any, any questions are welcome. I'm just gonna take a, take a sip. Okay. So I'm going to keep on going. If you have any questions, just let me know. Okay, I'm, I'm watching. 
I'm looking at um, any comments there are. Okay. So to get your child's attention, you have to get a few things straight. We talked about not repeating. That's the instruction side. And then giving a reward and praising. That's on the, the reward side at the end. That's a consequence. So I want to, if you have, if you've actually sent your child to therapy and your therapist um, actually took the time to teach you these kind of things, to talk about it, then you would know what I'm about to say, okay? And if you've actually gone online and checked out a lot of stuff, searched up stuff yourself, you would actually know this yourself. And um, this thing is very ABA, meaning it's very applied behavioral analysis. And once that is, what that is, it's like, it's just behavioral behavior behavioral therapy for children on the spectrum. Um, not every time is children on the spectrum, but um, what I'm about to tell you guys is something that they use a lot and I use a lot. I still use it a lot and I like it, okay? What this is, is what we call like uh, uh, ABC of therapy. And what is ABC, okay, what is, what, what's that? So A is called antecedent. Antecedent is a crazy word for it's just a really hard word for instruction, the setting, what cues, what prompts you're using, and then the behavior, that's A, okay? And then B is what is the behavior itself, what you're shooting for, where you're teaching your child, okay? It might be like toilet training. It might be changing, um, drinking water. It might be washing hands. It might be, it might be meowing. It might be whatever. So whatever you're teaching is the behavior. And then you have the C, which is the consequence, which helps the most okay which helps the most so see um the consequences like rewarding praising um sometimes if if you are like punishing that's also like a a, a type of consequence okay so all these stuff that i'm about to tell you you might have known already okay so the abcs why am i talking about this because sometimes no not sometimes a lot of times when parents first come to me, the first concern is always like, hey, my, my child isn't like, they're not even focusing. They're not even focusing. I tell them to draw something, they don't even focus. Well, the, you have to remember, what's the instruction? Did you dem demonstrate what is the desired outcome? What's the behavior? Did you tell them exactly what it is, right? Did, do they understand? Most of the time, if they don't do something and they're not focusing, it means that they don't understand. They don't understand what you want from them. And therefore, they, they would go away and just like throw stuff at you. Okay, that's just um, that's just how it is. But um, if you really take the time to make them understand in a fun way, nine times out of ten is that they're gonna have a lot more attention, a lot more joint attention on the task. Okay, so you have this is something I cannot tell you right now. Hey, do this, do that, because I don't know what the task or behavior is going to be for you. Okay, so take the time to really, really, really demonstrate and, and explain the task and what you want out of it, okay? That's why it's super hard to teach eye contact um, with strangers, right? Because you, you, you don't really demonstrate it, right? As a parent, as like, as like myself, I don't even say hi to a stranger. And you expect a child who is speech delayed to look at a stranger and say, hello, uncle, and good morning, auntie, that's just impossible. How are you going to demonstrate that? And how are you going to let them understand why you're doing it? At the age of like two to three or four or five, impossible, impossible. Um, the only way that would learn is by looking at you. So, so if you want them to do that, you got to do it yourself, man. You, you really have to. You really have to. If you really want them to talk to strangers, you have to talk to strangers is what I mean, okay? So now that we got that out of the way, like how's your instruction going? Have you said it over and over again? If you say over, over, over and over and repeatedly, what it means is you're teaching your child to actually ignore all your, your um, ignore all of your instructions and commands, right? So you say it once, I don't need a response. Say it twice, I don't need to respond. Say it three times, I don't need to respond. Why should I respond? There, sh this, there looks like there's no consequence coming up. It seems like I don't need to care about you. Yeah, so um, it's kind of like the, the story of, you know, the boy who cried wolf, right? <laughs> the first time, yeah, okay, fine, fair, I, I, I'll listen. 
But the second time, you know, it does the second time that you call wolf, they start to like have a disbelief that there's actually a result coming out of it. So you have to make your instructions its time worth. And what I mean by that, say it once and then see if they do it. Wait. If they don't, think about why. Think about why. Do they not understand the whole situation? Then you can tell them, hey, you didn't do it. Or, you know, say it in a more child-friendly way. I'm sorry. Something like this. Hey, you didn't do it. Or like, hey, um, whatever. Uh, Steve, you didn't do it. Uh, you didn't answer. That, that kind of feedback you need to tell them. Or even if they don't really understand what you're saying, the tonality will let them know that they didn't do certain thing or you, you're disappointed, okay? Kids will understand those stuff much better than words. And the reason is because they're, they're delayed and they're seeking for different types of information to help them fill in the gaps, okay? So you have to give a feedback, all right? And then think about why. Think about why it's not happening. So when you think about what's, why it's not happening, you have to think about if you've given the enough instructions and help for them to understand. So you have to circle back and go back. Let's say that you're teaching actually to say a word or like repeat what you say. If your child isn't repeating and you keep on saying like, say ah, say e, say, say whatever, say, um, say cup, say towel, all these kind of words and they're not responding, you're actually, teaching like like <laughs> i'll say reverse teaching them to respond to you because you're just throwing noise at them right so with that said that's actually quite uh um how to say yeah you should say it once and then help them and then help them think about how usually if they don't reply right tell them they do not repeat what you say that's the reason uh, the reason behind it is because they, they cannot do it yet. They don't understand why they have to do it, right? So start with some like big movements first, which we've talked about in the last live video. All right, so um, Vonnie, hi Vonnie. Vonnie says, I saw an ABA and sensory therapy from a friend who got an autistic child. They used loud voice, repeat one word over and over, make it louder. If not done by the child, I felt like you treat it like a, as a retarded person. But they said that is how the therapy is. Is it true? Um, no. <laughs> as much as I don't want to, you see, I hate, I hate it when therapists like bash each other because it makes us, it's like a, a, a bad way to like, a bad way to like market yourself, right? But it really isn't the, the way that you do it. So if you do it, then you should stop too. So the reason behind, let me tell you why, okay? They, they use a loud voice, repeat one over and over and make it louder um, if not done by the child. So let's use the framework just we just learned, okay? The A, B, and C. I, don't, I think you already forgot, but anyways, I'm just gonna go for it. So the instruction is like, is like a word, like um, ball, ball, let's say it's saying ball or something, ball. And then your child doesn't respond. And what you do is you make it even louder. So what, you're, what are you doing? Does the child understand your instruction? Probably not. <laughs> so when you, when you use, um, you, you say it louder, hoping that it will clarify things, it probably wouldn't. What it is, is actually, it would usually, it would most probably be um, that it's actually a punishment. So I'll punish the child for not giving a response, but they don't even know the, what the response is. So they're even more puzzled, okay? They're even more like don't know what's happening. So when that happens, what you need to think about, what you need to do is to actually, uh, to actually teach them why they have to say ah, okay? Actually say, <laughs> or, or say ball or anything. You know what, e, Vonnie, like when you ask me this, like I don't think even uh, a, a child who is mentally retarded will understand this task. No one will understand that. Why Why was that, okay? What you need to do is to get something, withhold it, as I've taught in my, in my courses and in my videos, 
is to get something they want. Let's say that this is something they want. Okay, actually, never mind. Let me get something that they really want. Um, right. So let's say that they want this like this switch. They like it. Somehow your child knows how to play it, and then um, they really want it, and you want to teach them to communicate in in words or like sounds. So the best way to do it is to like let them play it for a bit, let them taste it. They play it for a bit, right? And then you press a button here that they don't know how to undo. And usually that's this little small button here, right? Or on a, on an iPad, it might be like you lock it. Once you lock it, they're like, oh, I cannot, I cannot. You take it away, you turn it on, let them show them that you can do it. And then when they grab it, stop them. And then you say the word, right? You say, you say like, um, play and then if they don't respond you don't respond in a higher or like a louder tone because that's gonna, not going to help them and you're evaluating why and then afterwards you think about okay dude so they didn't understand because it's too hard maybe okay so I'm going to go down one level and try to just do like mouth shapes so I'm going to tell the kid hey you didn't do it you didn't say play let's try again like this how about like this so if he still cannot do it, then I'll think of, again, oh, probably I didn't help him enough. And then I'll say, hey, okay, so um, so uh, what I need to do is I need to say another feedback and say, hey, you didn't do it. You didn't do like that. Let me help you. I push the jaw down and I just give it to him. Good job. Here you go. Okay. So and another big mistake that we often neglect about teaching is the power of repetition. You have to keep on doing it. You have to keep on doing it. Okay, you have to keep on, you just have to keep on grinding it. You do it one time successfully, doesn't mean anything. You gotta do it like 30 times. <laughs> I, I just pulled that number out of nowhere. It depends on the child, okay? So, um, Savannah, thanks for your question. He says, hello, Ming, hi. Ming, I know what to do to stop the drooling. Yeah, of course you can, but um, because I know Savannah, Savannah's like, is working with my client at home right now. Thanks, Savannah. But um, let's say that there, I'll, I'll first, because there's other people watching on both uh, YouTube and Facebook, I'll first talk about why there's drooling, okay? After my cat calms down. Yeah, so why there's drooling, there's usually, 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 okay? There are more reasons to it, but two reasons why it doesn't happen. Number one, is that is this okay number one is they cannot manage the saliva they don't know how to like control it in their mouths and then swallow it that's that's number one reason okay number two reason number the number two reason is um they cannot feel the saliva and it's coming out okay so we have probably never tried the number the first reason of being uh, not able to control the saliva and uh, to actually swallow saliva. That we see in a lot of adult cases. Um, those are like stroke cases. If you have an elderly at home that like has a stroke, then, you know, it most probably is, I'm not really not most probably, but, you know, one of the biggest problems is that, you know, they have a weakness in their, in their muscles and they don't know how to control the tongue to like actually swallow it. Okay, we, we never actually tried that. But number two, the sensory one, we've all tried it. If we've been to a dentist, okay, if we've been to a dentist, then you must have tried it before, all right? You must have done, tried it before. If you've been through um, anesthetics, no, that's the wrong word. Okay, painkillers, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna further embarrass myself with my pronunciation. So um, if you've been through painkillers, you cannot feel your mouth. By accident, you're gonna have drooling happen because you couldn't feel it there. Okay, so for our client here, Zavanna, most probably it's her sensory because she can eat. Although she has a side of weakness in her mouth, she can eat and she can drink water. So, um, and she can use a straw. So most probably it's this, it's it's about the sensory. And how do we stop the drooling? for her in particular is by doing the, is by desensitizing her mouth. Okay, if you're watching this and your child also is drooling, 
just I'm just telling you, drooling stops at around one and a half years old, okay? And by the way, to tie in the topic of this video, drooling also happens when your child is focusing, when they're not very good at um, managing the saliva inside their mouths. When they focus, they will also drool. So that's also normal. Um, adults do it too. Adults, when we focus too much, we also do um, drool a lot. <laughs> like one of my friends, he just keeps on drooling whenever he's playing a game, um, which is kind of funny. But anyways, how do you stop it, Savannah, is that we cannot do it now because she's scared of all the talk tools and all the things that go inside the mouth. We have to brush her mouth to desensitize. Not really desensitize, maybe like to sensitize it because I don't know whether it's too sensitive or a lack of sensitivity. I need to see it myself, okay? If I were you, I would at least let her know, let our client know that uh, there is drooling happening. She needs to know what's happening and then for her to wipe it herself. When she feels that there's something here, at least she can go like that and sip it back in, all right? So what I want you to do, Ivana, if you really wanna get rid of drooling, if you really wanna get rid of drooling, is to do what we're doing with the toilet training as well, right? Um, try to spray some water here and let her feel. If she can feel it and then feel it here and she starts like going like that, then that's good, that's okay. My guess is even if you spray water with it here, she's not gonna care, all right? We gotta get her to care first. So we gotta spray more water here, get it all wet. And then say, hey, that is, it's wet, you're drooling, and then let's see what she does, okay? So that's my, um, that's a, the, the less intrusive way to do it for her, okay? All right, Ivani, so you said, um, have you got any experience handling a toddler who has a controlling character. So example, during during training, he or she ignores you instructions by purpose. Yeah, of course, man, of course. Um, that's actually 80% of all, all children. That's actually 80% of all children, Vonnie. And the reason I say this is because uh, if they don't control you, they would have learned the way um, to do stuff a long time ago. Okay, they would have learned doing it themselves a long time ago if they weren't controlling. So um, how I would do it is never give in. As I told you, just don't give in. Have a routine set up that they need to understand. They need to listen to you. <clears throat> if you watched inside the online course, course um, Vonnie, I did talk about how you have to for these kind of children, especially, you need to have micro, micro, micro commitments where they need to do things for you, no matter how small. If they're controlling, it means that it's still not a no brainer for them. They still think that um, they're losing out on you, right? You have to find tasks that are totally super, super easy for your child to do willingly. Okay, that's the magic word, word willingly do it. They willingly do it for, um, they willingly do it at a price. So meaning if you're holding something that they want, are they willing to do it? Ah, oh, sorry if you're watching on YouTube, I'm trying to make it lower. Okay, there you go. Yeah, are they willing to do it? Is, is your child willing to do it? If they're not, then do something easier. Get something that they want even more. Okay, upgrade your bait with a better, like a lack of a better word for it. Upgrade it, get something even more desirable, all right? The only way that they understand that you have control over them, well, I don't mean this in a bad way. What I mean is like, the only way that they understand that you are like hosting, you are the person, the owner of this house, the owner of everything around you, is that you need to do things that are easy for them to do and give them good stuff when that happens, okay? So if they ignore you on purpose, then you do something that they cannot ignore, right? For instance, just um, you do stuff like uh, body imitation, right? You do stuff like touch your nose, touch your face, touch your head, tap the table, that kind of stuff works because you can take her hand and actually finish it for her, okay? if you're telling her to do like like talk, 
you cannot go in with your fingers and make them talk yourself, right? It's impossible. <laughs> I wish that was possible, but it's impossible. So you need to start with those easy, super easy tasks to build a commitment towards your child first, or else it's not going to work. All right. And this is what I wanted to talk about as well. Um, I realized that I realized that um, structured tasks have a lot more merit than it has at home, simply because you lose out on um, you lose out on the home court advantage that I get when I'm at the therapy center, and you also lose out the type um, my facial expressions, my presence, and also my um, my way of talking to children. Okay. So structured tasks gives it makes it easier for you and your child to follow, especially you. Uh, what I would say from now on, if you want your child to focus and don't ignore you, even on purpose, is to do very structured stuff. So, for instance, let's get a piece of biscuit. All right, that I would break it up into very small pieces. I put it in a bowl, and then I'll just keep doing it for like five minutes. I'll just, oh, you want this? <laughs> Let's pretend that didn't happen, okay? Um, so what I would do is, what I would do is, um, sorry, I'm just so distracted. There's, there's like stuff everywhere now. <laughs> Why would you do that? Okay, so the bowl of biscuit is all small, okay, Vonnie, this is to you, man. Like you have to follow this to the dot. Bowl of biscuits, small pieces inside. Let's say that she likes biscuit or chocolate or anything that she really likes. Okay, one at a time. You pick it up. She's trying to grab it. Good. Turn her hand into open palm as we we're talking about. Give it to her. That's one. While she's eating, then you're picking up the next one. You're waiting. Once she finishes eating, she wants it again. She doesn't need to be sitting down, by the way. And when she comes over to do it, flip her hand again like that. Eat it. All right. The next one, once her hands become semi-automatic, you might want to add some more tasks to it. And what I like to do is like touching all around the face. Okay, you will you want to try like oh touch your nose, touch your nose. You help her do this, and then you take her hand and you, you do it together. All right. After that, give it to her, eat. All right. Keep on doing it. Keep on doing it. Just manipulate her hands. Manipulate her hands. If she really is someone as you. Um, as you say, like is a controlling character. I've seen many kids who would res restrain from letting me manipulate their hands. So if I'm doing this for them, they're like, they're like, they're like restricting. They're like refraining and like resisting towards my strength. And they're super strong as well for some reason. And so like, they're trying like, oh, and you're doing like that. So they, this even happens if they want the treat, they even want the reward, but they still do it for some reason sucks so tell me and try it if you hold her hand and she resists which is not by the way remember that i remember you telling me that her hands are very limp right so uh most probably not i think so zavana said yesterday i gave her pumpkin seeds i think that she does not like it so she asked me to clean her mouth by dragging my hand she feels so intimidated by oh irritated with the pieces sticking on her left and right. Yeah. So Zavanna, I think the problem about our client here is that the pumpkin seeds, when it sticks to um, these size, the bu this is called the buccal, if you wanna get textbook, um, the left and the right sides, Number one is she doesn't like the sensory that we can all agree on. Number two is most probably her tongue cannot go there and finish it on her own. So we're dealing with a few issues here is that um, the sensory issue of her mouth doesn't really help um, her. Uh, she can identify where it is, but she cannot get to it like that. This is something that I really wanted to work on, but for now we cannot do it. It's just impossible. So rather than that, you should teach her to use her own hand. So <laughs> rather than you you helping her, because that's not that's not natural if you help her with it, right? All right. So yeah, Anita. 
Nice talking to you again. Um, body imitation, no need sitting down. Yeah, no need to sit down yet. No need to sit down yet. Um, you don't really need to let your sit down, your, your child sit, sit down to do um, all kinds of stuff. If your child is over three years old, I would highly recommend that you teach them to sit down. But, but um, if your child at the moment still cannot imitate and you're doing it like to and fro, what I mean by to and fro, uh, let me start again. Okay. So body imitation, you don't need to sit down. Okay. But if they're over three years old, you should use sitting down as a task of its own. You have to teach them to sit down first before putting the task putting the task inside the sitting down. You know what I mean? You have to teach them to sit down first before you teach them anything sitting down. Oh, there you go. Um, yeah, so you don't need to do it. Body invitation, you don't need to do it. All right, you don't need to do that. Okay, right. So funny, yes, that's exactly how my child does. Now she eats fast and refuses me directing her hands. She even hits me if I try to direct her hand. Yeah. Yeah, so if that's the case, then you shouldn't direct your hand at the moment. You have to find something she, she would die for, Bonnie, and then use that as a way to entice her to let you direct, okay? So what I would do before I even try, um, Yeah, it seems like, like Vani, is Savannah's child like yours? Not really, but maybe, because I haven't haven't seen, really seen a lot of your child yet, Vani. I've only seen a bit. So I cannot say yes or no, okay? So she doesn't like you helping her point wave holding wet food or something mossy. Yeah, so that might be actually a problem with sensory, right? So what I would do is actually just to, in the beginning, I would, I would, I wouldn't even like touch her uh, and and hold her and make her do stuff, because we know she can actually talk, right? Um, the problem now is that she doesn't understand that she she can have help from us, and that might be because she's stubborn or she's really sensitive. And I'm leaning towards the more sensitive now, given that you told me that she doesn't like holding like wet, and mossy, mushy stuff. So what I want you to do from now on is to still have the bowl of food that she really loves. And then what you do, ne the next step is that you give her, every time you just brush her hand, like just like touch her all over. Oops, my mic came off. Um, touch her all over and then give it to her. If she's okay with it, just give it. And what you're doing is pairing the good experience with eating with you just touching, letting her know that that's okay. And if you want to search more on this, funny. And also, Zavanna, if you're watching this, you can also um, you can also uh, search up on this. It's something called tactile defensiveness. Tactile meaning like touching, tactile defensiveness. And usually that's more of a psychological thing. They might have started off with a very bad sensory experience. But the thing is, sensory in human beings are very hardly, it's very poorly understood. Like At least I'm poorly understood. Like, I don't really understand it. <laughs> so I'm telling you that. Um, sensory goes up and down, up and down, up and down every day. I might be pretty okay today since I'm very sensitive to sound, okay, as a person. And a lot of people don't understand. They think I'm just playing around. But I'm not, man. Like, for for like, for like real, I feel that the sound makes me dizzy and it it makes me sleepy. So after church, if, this, if I sit too close to the speakers, I will sleep on a Sunday after church for no reason. I should be very energized, but I sleep. Okay, so that's called a sensory overload. Does your child have that as well, Bonnie? You have to check it out, okay? But sensory can go up and down, which this is why it's very important for you to normalize it. Um, Wendy says, hello, can I chat you in private message? Thanks. Oh, you can send me an email, Wendy. For everyone watching, I'm, my email inbox is open for you guys. It's ming at agentsofspeech.com. So I'm gonna, let me type it. Actually, no, I won't type it so that only people who are watching will actually find me. So it's ming at agentsofspeech.com or else I'm, my inbox is gonna get flooded. It's already full as it is. <laughs> so I don't want anyone there, okay? So back to the point where I'm talking about like sensory. All right, talking about sensory. You have to normalize it, guys. 
every day it's going to be a little different. For me, sometimes I'm okay with going to concerts. Sometimes I'm not. And I realize um, that if I sleep enough, the sensory will be more, will be a lot better. If I'm like tired and everything, it's very hard for me. Uh, I'll get very like angst. <laughs> I'll be very susceptible, meaning um, very sensitive, you know, very sensitive. So we have to make sure that he's, your, your children, you guys, your children are okay with touching different textures. And we don't do it by just forcing it on them. We do something that is slowly increasing the difficulty. We need to let them understand that it's actually okay to touch this kind of stuff. And then most probably is because of one traumatic event, I feel like I don't have any theor theory to back this up yet. I'm gonna go out and find it. And then I'll tell you about my practical experience um, is that when I'm teaching children how to get their like hair cut, this stuff. Whenever you cut their hair, they go scream, they scream and they run away, right? It seems like it was when I do like ask them about the case history and everything, it seems like it's always starting from like one bad experience that had happened. And after that, they just associated everything bad with it. Everything bad. Yeah, so Vani, if it's sensory sensitivity, that's the first diagnosis made by a specialist psychologist you met a few months ago, then yeah, you, you should totally um, start doing some desensitization at home. And what I mean by that is just l for her to let you touch her, just to let you touch her. So everything that we've been doing for a bit, and, I, and from the videos I see sometimes, I see that you are also like, you also want things to happen, right? You're too fast slow down because children who are like tactile defensive, meaning don't touch me, defensive against touching because they have a certain, um, they have a certain bad experience about getting touched by some stuff or like textures, then that really means, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll, that, uh, then it really means, right, you, you have to desensitize it and you have to slow down, okay? So I don't wanna use this experience, but you know, if you have had a bad experience about something and um, people come at you, let's say you had a bad experience about getting sold on the street by sleazy salespeople. If a salesperson comes up to you like, whoa, like, hey man, I'm gonna have like five minutes of time, whatever, um, you're, not, you're not gonna like it. So whereas if you go slowly and you like talk nicely and approach them in a soft way, then it's much easier to actually help him. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I can I can tell that you're impatient. Um, yeah, Zivana, if you're having yeah, I'm actually making a video about haircuts in the online course. So if you guys are inside already, it's going to be available this this week or two. Okay, and you can use the framework for anything. Okay, it's just it's still it's just the framework I learned working as a ABA therapist back in Hong Kong. It's called desensitization. Uh, full credit goes to my, my supervisor there back long time ago. I think she's still there. Very good person. Very, very good. Taught me a lot of stuff. And now I'm teaching you guys. So de desensitization is very important. And um, a lot of therapists will discount sensitivity as a, as a reason behind a lot of stuff, especially ABA, especially sometimes speech, okay? OT, occupational therapists are all about sensory so um yeah you guys have to be very very patient about this stuff <laughs> very very patient you just as i was teaching zivana about um <clears throat> about what's that called um toilet training desensitization is also the same thing you have to be slow about it you have to be slow about it because they already had a bad experience <clears throat> going through um, some certain things that made them didn't want to do that. They, did, they didn't want to like, uh, sorry, I'm getting very distracted by my cat again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's, it's like playing with my my jar. Anyways, um, and I wonder how you guys work at home with your, with your kids around. It's just impossible, man. Um, yeah, so you have to be very, very patient about it. All right, you have to be very, very patient. And you cannot see results in a day or two right? In terms of sensitivity stuff, 
what I know is that it takes a long time. It takes a long, long time. There was one child who came to like our clinic in Hong Kong around like two, two, actually three years ago. My God, like three years ago. And um, <clears throat> the senior therapist back then asked if I could see any things that I could comment on about the kid. And of course, it's a test, right, from the boss. Um, and I had to be careful <laughs> what I said. Uh, and the thing was, it's actually, it's actually that he didn't like to wear long sleeve clothes or like long pants. Um, I actually don't like pants as well. I'm always in shorts. I just feel like it's not, it's very hot. But that kid, whenever they would sleep, he was always scratching, 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 getting it out of the way, getting it out of the way. So apparently that's also a sign of sensitivity. So if you can see your child doing that kind of stuff, you have to think about what you have to desensitize your, um, your child upon, right? For Zivana, that's the mouth, for sure. The hands, yeah? The feet, as I remember, she's still tiptoeing. It's something I want to work on as well, okay? Um, later. This is, it just boggles my mind that it hasn't been solved yet since so many years. It's just as a toilet training. If you do the steps of desensitization and step-by-step -step learning and using the time to teach her the correct sensory inputs and anticipating, then it shouldn't be a problem, right? It just hurts my mind that Zavanna she is still tiptoeing and she still, uh, she still has problems with, with toilet training. It means that not enough effort has gone in. Um, not enough correct effort, I would say. And that's not your fault. It's just the people who have been supervising, they, haven't, they didn't think that it wouldn't work on her, right? Um, and it needs to be very customized. And, and yeah, <laughs> yeah, Vonnie, my, my cats are very, very funny. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, and same for you, Vonnie. Like, if you have like sensory issues in your child, you have to find out and then make sure that she's okay at least for you to touch her. Or else, without the touching part, it's very hard to teach her more stuff. Okay, especially if she has um, difficulty in pronouncing words, you're gonna have to touch her mouth. That's just the end of it. And she hates it, then she's not gonna talk. Right. So for now, just go and teach her how to. <laughs> be touched okay i know it's it's difficult right so to tie back into like the, the whole thing about <clears throat> focus the last thing i want to talk about is this is perfect so if your child is there's a lack of focus you don't like it or whatever um one of the main 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 reasons why is because they don't like it they don't like what how they're treated um the sensory input and all that. So you need to take a look if your child is going like this when you're talking, it means you're too loud. <laughs> it means you're talking too close to them, okay? Um, if your child runs away, if you put your face towards them, it means you're too close. They don't like the sensory of being too close. Proximity is also a sensory, by the way. You know, if I put my hand here, they can, they can feel it, all right? Even if the child isn't looking, if I put my hand right here, telling them not to move, they won't move, right? It's also a sensory input. Somehow they can feel it. I don't know why. Some energy, woo-woo kind of stuff, not really. It's just um, proprioceptive, okay? They just can feel it here, right? That's also sensory input. Hi, Miss, hi, water pistols, how are you? Yeah, so, um, yes. Well, Vonnie says, to be honest, I haven't taught my child to brush teeth. Yeah, that's going to be difficult. I mean, you're going to have to do it step by step. And the best way to do it for me, how I've done it with other clients and what I've taught is by um, doing it together once your child knows how to imitate. So if she's so strong-willed, she's going to be wanting to do it herself, right? So I don't think that's the biggest issues right now, Bonnie. And the biggest issue is to get her to be okay with you touching her or else... Um, later on, you cannot really hold her hand to brush her teeth. Okay, so it's uh, the it's coming down to the last minute of our live time, and I'll be at I'll be here at the same time at 9 a.m. And if you haven't, you guys go to agentsofspeech.com, check out what I have there. There are two courses that I'm making, so if you guys want to go check it out um, and go on the waiting list. the The current one is rather basic, I believe. Um, 
But the two other ones, one is called zero from zero to words. Um, that's from that's teaching your child how to do verbal imitation from nothing. So I think that's very important. A step by step um, way to do it, right? And another course is about like word com combination, combiners, how you like combine words together. So if you guys are interested in that, go to agentsofspeech.com and check it out. Sign up for the waiting list. Because that one I'm actually doing right now and trying to make the course with my online clients. We're trying to um, teach children how to expand sentences using like extra cues, like visual gestures, uh, more on the gestures. So if you haven't also, go to my YouTube channel and check out the, the video about expanding sentence length using gestures. Okay, that's super cool. We're, we're actually getting a lot of progress with my online clients. Before he would like speak one or two words, but now it's like if you cue the correct way with the gestures, if you teach him the gestures first and then you cue, he can talk in like three or four words now, which is awesome. All right. So, all right, guys, that's all for today. I'll see you guys on Wednesday morning. So that's it for now. I'm going to stop it on Facebook um, right now. So see you guys. Bye.